Imagine working in one of the biggest luxury department stores in the world. When you walk through the doors, you enter an oasis of perfume and makeup counters, shoes, clothing, handbags, home decor, food, wine, and jewelry on seven floors. For one young woman, this was her dream job. She was completely in her element until one summer evening when her life was stolen in the blink of an eye. This is her story. Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. I'm Kimberlea, and if you've never been here before, it's nice to finally meet you. And if you have been here before, you'll probably know that I am close to the end of my pregnancy now. I think I have about eight weeks left, somewhere around there. So what I wanted to tell you is that I do not want to go on a hiatus. I don't want this channel to be without content when my baby's born. So I will tell you that my posting schedule might get a little weird in between now and the time that I give birth, which will be the end of June, because I'm trying to take breaks in between like tiny ones. So maybe my videos won't come out every single week at the exact same time on Thursdays or Fridays like they usually do. But just give me a little bit of grace and time and your patience because this is a big part of my life. And I'm super excited, but I don't want to leave you hanging. And don't forget, you can always watch videos on my Dark Livity channel as well. Those will still be coming out. But rest assured, if you see me going a little more than a week in between my videos, it's because I am creating more videos so that I don't go anywhere when the baby comes. Before I jump in, I'd like to introduce you to one of our longtime sponsors, and that is Dipsy. We use our phones for everything these days. You're probably watching this video on your phone right now on the YouTube app, and there's an app for everything, including the Dipsy app to indulge in some fantasies. It's an app full of hundreds of short, sexy audio stories designed by women for women. Think of it like a romantic novel, but brought to life with audio, including immersive soundscapes and realistic characters. So it's best to listen with headphones on so you can really lose yourself in the moment. All the stories are told by narrators with soothing voices, helping you get wrapped up in second chance romances, adventurous vacation flings, and hot and heavy hookups. Let me give you an example. During the storm, the heavy rain had knocked the soft pink blossoms off their branches as the wind continuously swept the petals and swirls across the street. Now that the rain has stopped, the city glimmers all around me. The shifting traffic lights reflect off the wet cars and street signs. And I know that some of you love to fall asleep to a good story. Well, Dipsy has soothing sleep stories. Those are the ones that I really like, especially with all the sounds that soothe you to sleep. Or you can explore a wellness session or even a written sexy story that you can read. For listeners and viewers of this show, Dipsy is offering an extended 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com slash Kimberlea. That's 30 days of full access for free when you go to dipseastories.com slash Kimberlea. And thank you so much to Dipsy for making today's video possible. Now, let's get into the case. So today's case is one that has haunted me for a while. And I'm sure you're going to feel the same. It's one of those cases where it leaves you questioning so many things and asking why, but it also makes you ask yourself, what would I do? Like, what would you do if this was happening to you? And those, to me, are the most scariest cases where you can't even imagine a way out. And today I am taking you to the United Kingdom. I think this is the first time I'm covering a case in the UK, and this was a suggestion from one of you, so thank you so very much. The young woman that I'm introducing you to today shares the exact same first name and the same spelling with my mom. Her name is Claire, and they spell it C-L-A-R-E, and it's such a beautiful name. And today I'm introducing you to the lovely Claire Marie Bernal. She was born on July 25th of 1983, in Groomsbridge, which is a village on the border of Kent and East Sussex in England. Groombridge is straight out of a fairy tale. It has beautiful green pastures and rivers and a population of only about 1,600 people. It's a two-hour train ride from London, which means you're close enough to the city to take a day trip and go shopping, and I have still yet to visit England. It's on my list. Let me know if you are from there. But Claire's mom, Patricia Adams, who went by Trisha, was a chef, and her dad, Martin, was an executive who worked in finance and did a lot of business in London. 
Claire was the oldest of three children. She had two brothers, James, who was only one year younger, and Philip, that was a baby. He was about five years younger than Claire. And as the oldest child, Claire was responsible, and she was actually the glue that held her family together. Being the only daughter, she had a very close relationship and friendship with her mother and her father. But unfortunately, when it came to the relationship between her parents, that one proved to be less solid as the years went by, and when Claire was only seven, her parents did get a divorce. However, Claire remained upbeat and positive through this entire process, and if she had been worried about the ways it might change their family dynamic, she never showed it. But she was still fairly young at the time, and she maintained a close relationship with both her mom and her dad, even though they moved to separate homes, of course, and Martin went out to Orpington, and this was a 30-minute drive away, and her mom, Trisha settled into Royal Tunbridge Wells, and that was just five minutes away from where they were already living. It took a lot for Claire to open up as a child, and when she did, she was kind, loving, trusting, and soft-spoken. She was also quite creative and artistic. Once they moved and they were on their own with Trisha raising the children, Claire started watching her mom do her makeup every morning. And by the time she was 12, Claire was experimenting with all kinds of different makeup looks herself. She even loved doing her mom's makeup and makeup on her friends when they had sleepovers together. Claire attended St. Gregory's Catholic Comprehensive School and actually got a job working for a local store so that she could fund her love for her makeup. She would always love to purchase things when she had a little bit of extra money. And this is when she started to come out of her shell. She became best friends with a coworker of hers named Adam Ward. And every time they hung out, they would talk for hours and there was no topic off limits. Claire was attentive, warm, and she never had anything bad to say about anyone except maybe herself because she did not recognize her own beauty and she felt like she needed to rely on makeup to boost her confidence, just like many high schoolers when they're coming into their own. But Claire was naturally beautiful on the inside and it would shine outward. But if she didn't notice her beauty, other people certainly did. And by the time Claire was 18, she was a stunning young woman with long, wavy golden brown hair, flawless skin, thick, gorgeous lashes, and a beautiful smile. Her eyes stood out to me. Sometimes they actually look gold in pictures. They're very beautiful. They're a very unique hazel color. And of course, being a self-taught makeup artist and a very good one, her makeup always looked perfect. When she walked down the street with her friend Adam or her cousin Kristen, Men's heads would literally turn to catch a glimpse of Claire as she passed by. However, Claire was still oblivious, which everyone thought was funny and endearing. Her focus was on others. She was dedicated to making sure everyone else felt comfortable and beautiful and loved, and that's why it was impossible not to like Claire. She went to West Kent College in Tunbridge, where she studied beauty therapy for two years, and one of her professors, Angela Wheat, said that Claire was a pleasure to teach. She kept her head down and she worked hard, and Claire achieved her diploma through the Business and Technology Education Council in 2001. In college is where she met her friend Amanda, who actually nicknamed her Claire Bear, and Amanda said Claire was sweet and good nature. They never had disagreements, and this was probably because Claire was a bit of a people pleaser. And she was a tad bit stubborn as well because when she made up her mind, she put her foot down. There was no budging, especially when it came to her career goals. Claire wanted to do professional stage makeup. She wanted to work on movie sets or theater, and she practiced every day. She trained as a beauty consultant and theater makeup artist at Shepperton Studios, and in 2003, she began actually sending out a bunch of emails and mail to various department stores, hoping to get more practice in consultation. These were those kind of cold emails, kind of like cold calls, where you just cross your fingers and you send out a bunch of messages to people that you don't know, but you want to connect with. Claire was fearless. She figured, sure, maybe these people don't know me yet, but maybe one of them will be so impressed. So she contacted the biggest department store pop-ups like MAC, Yves Saint Laurent, Estee Lauder, Laura Mercier, and she actually landed an interview with La Prairie and Harvey Nichols. And this was everything. Because even though I wasn't familiar with La Prairie, it's a huge well-known brand. It's a luxury skincare brand. It's known for something called Skin Caviar. You might've seen it before. And I looked online and they have bundles of skincare 
that retail for over about 1,400 pounds, and that is about $1,800. So we're talking expensive. Let me know if you've ever tried it. I have not. And Harvey Nichols itself is world famous. It's a big, big department store. It's a big mall shopping center. At the time, it was in the top three in London, along with Selfridges and Harrods. So Claire was understandably very nervous. It would be a dream come true to work in London for such prestigious companies. She convinced her friend Adam to ride with her on the train to the Charing Cross station and then to La Prairie for her interview. On the ride, Claire was going through the pages and pages of her resume and her notes, asking Adam to quiz her on her portfolio. She was so meticulous. She went through it again and again until Adam finally said, listen, you're gonna nail it. You don't have to worry. Of course, she did. She got the job and her friends and family never doubted her for a second. In the fall, Claire made the big move to London from Tunbridge Wells, which is about an hour away. And soon she began to work at Harvey Nichols which is located in Kingsbridge in Westminster in central London. And I miss malls so much. This one is known for seven levels of shopping with food and wine markets, cafes, bars, and private dining. And I'm getting nostalgic. Malls were a staple in my childhood, like many of yours. And on the ground floor of Harvey Nichols, there are dozens of display tables for skincare, cosmetics, perfume, with brand-specific booths along the walls. And Claire and three other women were in charge of the La Prairie booth, and it was common for well-to-do and wealthy women to come in and sit in the makeup chairs and get makeovers and get shade matches. That was one of Claire's jobs. She would shade match shoppers and then recommend the right products for them. And she was very proud of her work and always looked the part, making sure that her makeup was flawless. She was a walking billboard. She was fashionable. Her hair was always in place. Her posture was immaculate, which I need to work on. And her voice was soft and even musical. She was made for this job. And it was the perfect job for a 21-year-old. She and her coworkers worked half days, and then they spent the evenings going to parties and exploring London. Claire also did some promotional work at Selfridges, and this is a rival department store, and that was so she could help pay her bills. She got really close with her La Prairie colleagues, especially Susan Cantez and Natalia Serapanova. Susan was around Claire's age and she worked part-time and Natalia was a few years older than Claire. And she thought of both of them as her older sisters that she never had. She also looked up to some of the other La Prairie colleagues, including an older woman who had worked at Harvey Nichols for 13 years. Eventually, Claire, Susan, and Natalia got a flat together or an apartment for those of us in the U.S., and it was located in Duluk Village, which is a safe neighborhood about a 40-minute train ride away from the mall. It's cute. It's a green area that feels like the countryside, and Claire felt right at home. She still stayed very close with her mother, Trisha, who is now living with her boyfriend, Peter Warburton, still in Tunbridge Wells. And she was also still close with her father. At this point, her two brothers were also living with their father. But Claire was so busy that sometimes those she was very close to and loved were a little further away. So she wouldn't get that much time to talk to them or see them. But for example, she wouldn't talk to her friend Adam for months at a time, but when they did see each other, it was like no time had passed at all. And I'm sure all of us have at least one friend that's like that. Claire got used to the party scene in London as well. She enjoyed being single and hanging out with her girlfriends. She was definitely a girl's girl. And while she would give some men a chance, she was really picky with anything long-term at this point because she was kind of having fun casually dating that state of mind at the time. But then a handsome guy named Michael Pesh started working as a security guard for Harvey Nichols in 2004 and he caught Claire's eye. He had sparkling blue eyes and a kind of cute crooked grin. And eventually Michael came up and started talking to Claire at her beauty counter. In late January of 2005, he asked Claire out on a date. And she was honestly flattered. She called her mom right away and excitedly told her she met this handsome, shy, but very attentive man that was originally from Slovakia. He previously had been in the military for a while, and then he moved to the UK on a student visa. And now he was a security guard at the front doors of Harvey Nichols. Claire told her mom that they'd already been on three dates, 
And she told her mom about them. They got coffee. They had these deep conversations walking in the park. And Claire thought he was well-traveled and fun to talk to. But the only thing is she wasn't sure at this point she wanted to get serious with anyone. Also, there was the fact that Michael was nine years older than Claire, and he had recently gone through a divorce. What do you personally think about age gaps? I just like reading your thoughts. But in this case, as Claire got to know him, she discovered that Michael at 30 years old was serious about getting into a committed relationship. And sometimes you just know what you want. But to be fair, at this point, Claire thought he was much more into her than she was into him. And since she wasn't sure what she wanted and she didn't have her mind set on a long-term relationship, she wasn't sure how to go about this. And sometimes that's really hard because you're enjoying someone's company. But then there's this feeling looming over you. Like you don't want to lead them on if you're not thinking there's more there, but you also have a good time and you're into that. So Claire respected her mother's opinion. And when she showed Trisha a picture of Michael, Trisha right off the bat wasn't sure that he was right for her daughter. She thought he looked too old for her. And there was something about his eyes. It looked like he had been through a lot, maybe seen some things when he was younger, and it's true. He was in the military, and they do say don't judge a book by its cover, but it was fine because this little fling didn't last very long anyway. Just three weeks later, on February 28th, Claire broke things off. She had pretty high expectations when it came to dating someone long-term, and she wanted to experience different men and have more casual connections to find out what it was she was actually looking for in the long run, like most of us do before we settle down. But in April of 2005, Claire, Susan, and Natalia moved into another flat in Dulick, and this was a multi-story brick building, and life was really picking up. In July, Claire turned 22, and her mom took her on a five-day birthday trip to Florence, Italy, where they went to music festivals, and they got photos of the two of them drinking, dancing, laughing, and just having an overall great time together. Claire liked learning about new cultures, and she told her mom that she planned to learn Italian. Trisha was so proud of the woman that Claire had become. She wasn't just Trisha's daughter, she was Trisha's best friend. And it actually makes me sad knowing what's to come. Also that summer, Claire started seeing a new guy and things were going pretty well. It was a whirlwind romance. She was getting coffee with him in Tundred Wells when she ran into her friend Isabella from St. Gregory's. Claire and Isabella caught up and Claire told her she loved living in London and was also thriving in a new relationship. But she was clearly in the honeymoon phase, and she even told Isabella that she could see herself marrying this one. Isabella was happy to hear that Claire had found someone who suited her and was doing well. Now, Claire usually worked the morning shift at Harvey Nichols, but on Tuesday, September 13th, she agreed to switch shifts with one of her roommates. It was your average closing shift. Claire stood at the La Prairie counter across from Victoria Daniels, who was working behind a different makeup counter. They just watched as customers exited the store with their shopping bags. And around 7.45 p.m., Victoria waved at Claire, kind of pointing to her watch as if to say, there's only 15 minutes left before they were free. Claire nodded and beamed that the shift was finally coming to an end. And at this time, a few customers were walking through the beauty section, heading for the door that led out to Sloan Street. Another coworker of Claire's, Helen Quinn, was packing up for the day as well. Victoria and Claire were just smiling at one another, but those smiles would quickly fade. Before anyone could comprehend what was happening, the mall was in complete chaos. People were running, there were loud noises and screaming, and several witnesses called 999 to report that there had been a shooting. A shooting at Harvey Nichols was unreal. It was very unexpected. The dispatcher assigned the case to Detective Chief Inspector Colin Sutton of the Metropolitan Police Department. And his first thought when he heard there was a shooting was to drive out to West London, since there had been recent shootings in Hampson and Stonebridge Park estates. But when Sutton found out that the shooting was actually at Harvey Nichols, he was in awe. He wasn't expecting that. And he knew right away that this case would be all over the news. He reached out to Sergeants Dave and Mark Leach, they're actually brothers, and he asked them to please meet him at the scene. Sutton was the first to arrive, 
and he spoke to management and he was informed that they believed there were two fatalities. Two people were deceased. Sutton relayed this to the station and the rest of the homicide department arrived not too long afterward. They were shocked that anyone could have gotten into Harvey Nichols armed. The victims were a male and a female and the detectives walked over to where the female victim was laying right near the makeup counter and they saw a young woman lying face up with a large amount of blood pooling on the ceramic tiles around her head. She appeared to have been shot multiple times in the face, which is just horrific. And the man was lying nearby covered in blood on his face and arms which were outstretched. There was a pistol on the ground nearby and bullet shells around his body. It appeared he had taken his own life with a shot to his right temple. The Harvey Nichols team confirmed that this was Michael Pesh, who had worked as a security guard on the ground floor. If anyone knew how to sneak in a gun, it would be him. But why had Michael killed himself and possibly this young girl? Was he jealous? Was he mentally unwell? Was he working alone, they wondered. And how did he have access to a gun? Sutton learned from management that this was a murder-suicide between two employees who had dated and previously had issues. That's when they were informed that the female victim was Claire Bernal. Not knowing the backstory, Sutton began his investigation with a post-incident debriefing with all of his officers sitting at one of the makeup counters, and he asked everyone to treat Claire's case as a standard homicide investigation. So to start without any biases, as if they knew nothing and they were going into this with a clean slate, pretty much do the police work and look for clues. But the head of security, Brian Lenahan, offered to give the Metropolitan Police a file from when he did his own investigation of Michael's previous behaviors. But Sutton decided not to look at this file. He wanted to do his own investigation before he let any information cloud his perspective. I think that could be smart, but we will circle back to this. I can understand why they want to start from scratch, but I also think there's a lot of valuable information about what had already occurred between Michael and Claire. At that point, Sutton didn't know anything about Claire or her family, but what he did know is they deserve justice. He spoke with the press and the store management while the other officers gathered forensic evidence. They found six bullet shells at the crime scene, but from what they could tell, Claire had been wounded four times and Michael only once. So there was a missing bullet. The CEO actually called Sutton and he asked if he could open up the mall the very next day. He said that every minute Harvey Nichols is closed, they lose out on thousands of pounds. And I understand business is business, but that's also pretty insensitive. And Sutton insisted they need to stay closed, especially as long as they couldn't find that sixth bullet. But can you imagine walking into one of the nicest stores in the world and stumbling upon a bullet? That wouldn't fly. And the CEO agreed they could take as much time as they needed. His reputation was on the line, and this investigation had to take precedence over business. Sutton was informed that Claire lived with two coworkers who worked part-time, Susan and Natalia, who was from Russia. Claire wasn't supposed to be at work that evening, and I have done a couple other cases where someone has changed shifts with someone and ended up dead. She was scheduled for Tuesday morning shifts, and the staff said that they knew Michael knew her schedule. She always had the same one, so Sutton wondered, how he found out that Claire was working a different shift at Harvey Nichols that night. That's when Sutton realized Michael might have figured out Claire's new address and checked her flat before going to Harvey Nichols. What if Natalia and Susan were at home in the middle of this murderous rampage? So his stomach dropped and he jumped in his car with Officer Tony McEwen and they raced over to see if Natalia and Susan were okay. When they arrived at Claire's new flat in East Dulick, it was quiet. The sun was just going down. People were finishing up dinner, watching TV in their homes. And Sutton and McEwen knocked on Claire's door and they tried to open it, but it was locked. If Michael had gotten inside through the front door, he probably would have left it unlocked behind him. But there was a possibility that he might've climbed through a window. So the officers went back to their car and debated what they should do. Should they break the door down or should they just wait? And that is when they saw a woman walking by wearing a gym outfit and a duffel bag and she was talking on the phone. They were listening 
as she stopped outside the apartment and sat on a short brick wall in front, and Sutton got out of the car, and that's when he overheard her speaking in Russian. So he figured that this was probably Natalia. He interrupted her and asked what she was doing outside, and Natalia said she couldn't get inside because she was waiting on one of her roommates that she shared a key with. Sutton asked her if she by chance was waiting for Claire Bernal, and Natalia said yes. She was, and I'm sure she was confused as to how these officers knew that. That's when they said they needed to break some terrible news to her, that Claire had been killed. And Natalia was, of course, upset and scared, but honestly, she wasn't shocked. She suspected Michael right away, and she let the officers know that Michael was constantly hanging around Claire's makeup counter back in January, and the two of them went on three dates around February, and that's it. However, this man was clingy. He demanded that Claire spend time with him every day, and from what Natalia could tell, it was a very toxic relationship, mainly because of Michael. He was a toxic person that wouldn't take no for an answer. Natalia said she put her foot down, and she told Claire she didn't want Michael coming over. She didn't approve of him, but she told the officers that after that, one day he did come over again. And that's when him and Claire had a falling out and Claire kicked him out of their house. After that, Natalia said that Michael showed even more of his true colors. He texted and called Claire nonstop, followed her around, and he would even act like they were still in a relationship and they clearly were not. He would profess his love to her. He would even tell her it was the anniversary of the day that they met. And that's pretty scary. Natalia told Sutton that Claire wasn't sure what to do, and Michael's stalking only got worse. They didn't understand why he would not leave her alone. Natalia said that he would follow Claire home from work and stand outside their flat, saying he wanted to apologize. And he would tell Claire how much he loved her. Loved? This man had only been on three dates. That's it. Natalia explained how she and Susan defended Claire and told Michael to leave, and he yelled and cursed at them and caused a scene outside. They were so scared and so fed up with him, the three of them actually moved flats in April to get away from this man. She went on to explain that at that time, Michael was actually fired from Harvey Nichols and was under investigation by the Metropolitan Police. He stopped stalking Claire in the summer, and Natalia figured he was in jail. So how the hell had he gotten out? Wow, so a lot had transpired between the time Claire met Michael and her lying lifeless on the floor of the mall. How could this have happened if he had already gotten to a point where he was possibly in jail? This is what detectives needed to understand, and of course, they wanted to know who Michael Pesh was. Sutton and McEwen found Michael's address and headed there next. It was a large flat at the end of the street in South Tottenham. It was a good 40 minutes away from Claire's, and a very different type of area. Way more run down, and at this point, it was completely dark outside. The street wasn't well lit, but from what they could see, it was a house in pretty bad shape. The grass alone was three feet high. All the windows were either boarded up or broken, and the front door was left open. It looked like a drug house, and if this is where Michael was living, they thought he was probably mixed up with some dangerous people. It took Sutton and McEwen a moment to build up the courage to actually go inside. Now, they didn't have any probable cause to bring backup officers, but they did think someone or something inside had information on where Michael got his gun. For all they knew, this house could have been filled with guns. Sutton pulled out a mini maglite flashlight and didn't even knock. He just walked right in to this creepy dark house after midnight. They found not one, not two, but seven men asleep in that house. That was a pretty wild confrontation. I can't imagine being the officers or the men in this situation, but luckily none of the men seemed to be armed, but all of them were from Eastern Europe and were not fluent in English. Only one, a six foot eight guy named Jorg from Poland knew enough English to be able to translate what the officers were saying and what the men would say back. He turned out to be a really nice guy and was super helpful. He explained that everyone living in that house was on a visa. They were doing building projects and trade work. And Jorg said Michael used to be their eighth roommate. He was kind of the odd one out though. He would sit alone in his bedroom writing in a notebook 
while the other guys went out for drinks. He said that Michael actually seemed really sensitive and kind until the beginning of March. Then he would randomly explode with anger. So he moved out in late April and they weren't sure what happened to him. But Yorg said he never thought that Michael would be a murderer. That was shocking to find out. But the detectives were still very early in this investigation. So it turned out Michael's old roommates were pretty regular guys from what it seemed. Sutton and McEwen were convinced that Michael was working alone, but they didn't have the whole story. While Sutton and McEwen investigated, two other officers visited Claire's dad, Martin, at his home in Kent to tell him and Claire's brothers that she was no longer alive. And I, every time I hear this, I can't imagine the heartbreak of finding out that kind of information. No one expects to hear that. And Martin felt blindsided. He had never even heard of Michael. He didn't know Claire even had an ex-boyfriend. And in his grief, he was angry. He was angry that Trisha had kept this from him. But to be fair, Michael really wasn't Claire's boyfriend. There were a lot of wires being crossed right now and lots of emotions involved. Martin was, of course, devastated. His little girl, his only daughter, who spent her life living for other people, had her murder put on display. It was made a spectacle, done right in public, and he didn't think she deserved this. At 2.30 that morning, the officers visited Trisha's house. She had spent the evening celebrating one of her friend's birthdays. She got home around midnight, and she had already gone to bed with her boyfriend, Peter, when they heard a loud banging at the front door. Peter got up and went downstairs, and Trisha was straining to listen to this conversation. She was able to catch the words Metropolitan Police and Claire. And that's when she knew that her worst nightmare had come true. She rushed downstairs and she asked, how did it happen? And the officers responded that Claire had been shot. And Trisha immediately said, it was Michael, wasn't it? They seemed taken aback, but not it. Why is it that no one was surprised, yet this wasn't prevented? It makes me so angry. And Trisha just felt like time had slowed down. There were an infinite number of emotions and questions running through her mind and her heart. She couldn't make sense of any of this. She spent the rest of the night in total shock. She was too upset to talk to anyone. She was just buried in her grief and guilt. But by the next morning on Wednesday, September 14th, the Metropolitan PD found that sixth bullet in the mall. It was lodged up in the ceiling. And now it was time for frightened coworkers and staff to be interviewed about what they witnessed the night before. Everyone wanted to help. Everyone who knew Claire adored her, and they couldn't believe that this was happening. Police talked with Claire's coworkers and learned the same thing they had heard from Natalia, that Claire and Michael went on just three dates before the relationship took a turn for the worse. According to one coworker named Maylin, who worked in the jewelry department, Claire and Michael had an argument. And they said that it was Michael that ended things, but that he regretted it. And when he tried to win Claire back, she didn't want to be with him. But Michael became persistent and he was crossing many of Claire's boundaries, which led to mediation from the staff at Harvey Nichols. Michael was fired and he was banned from coming back to work. So obviously it was bad enough to warrant him not being able to work there anymore. And now it's time to talk to one of the last people to see Claire alive. Victoria Daniels, who was working right across from where Claire was the night she was shot. Based on Victoria's recollection, it seemed Michael had shot Claire before she even knew she was in danger. She explained it was an average closing shift. Victoria and Claire were smiling at each other as those last few patrons were finishing up their purchases and leaving the building. But then all of a sudden, while Victoria is looking into Claire's smiling face, she saw a shadow behind Claire's booth. She could tell it was a man, and he was sneaking up behind the counter like he was a spy. So Victoria was taken aback. She didn't have much time to process what was actually happening in that moment. She thought it was either a crazy customer trying to steal something, or Claire's new boyfriend trying to surprise her. But Claire kept smiling as Victoria saw this man take out a black pistol, aim it at the back of Claire's head, and pull the trigger. Victoria froze. She couldn't believe what she had just seen. She watched as Claire collapsed to the ground. 
Victoria wasn't even able to move. She was in total shock. And she watched as this man quickly approached Claire, where she had fallen behind the counter, and fired several more shots at the floor. Victoria didn't see what happened next because she ran, but she heard two more shots ring out behind her. And when she looked over her shoulder, she didn't see the man anymore. The rest of the store was in a total panic. Helen Quinn said she saw the first shot, but she immediately dove to the floor before she saw the rest and she covered her head. One witness thought that the store was being robbed. Another witness who was eating dinner on the lower level with her friends and future roommate were interviewed and they said, we had finished our meal and were walking out of the beauty hall towards Sloan Street when I heard a crack that sounded like a glass perfume bottle being dropped on the floor about 10 feet behind me. I was startled. I looked around expecting to see people moving to clean it up. And then I heard what I think is three or four more bangs and we realized it was a gun. People started screaming and my friend and I ducked behind one of the makeup counters. I then heard another bang and we ran across the floor to the door across the road and into Kingsbridge tube station. The whole time feeling so exposed and thinking there was a shooter taking shots at shoppers in the store. We were in shock and it didn't even cross our minds to call the police. We just hugged each other. We could still see people walking into the store and a few minutes later, the police turned up. So we crossed back over the road to give statements and they told us that there was no longer a threat. Now that was because we know that Michael took his life. But from what detectives could gather from the scene and the interviews, it appeared as though Michael shot Claire three times in rapid succession and accidentally fired a shot into the ceiling as he attempted to take his own life. That is how that sixth bullet got lodged up there. On the same day, the 14th, Detectives found the hotel where Michael had actually been camping out. Sutton, McEwen, and Yorg headed to Earl's Court. This was about a 40-minute drive from South Tottenham where Michael had previously been staying with his seven roommates, but only a 20-minute drive from Claire's flat. In the hotel room, they didn't find any firearms, indicating that Michael only had that one gun. They couldn't figure out how he got it, though. Yorg found Michael's 40-page notebook that he always saw him writing in. He wrote in both English and Slovak. And on one page, Michael had written down Claire's new address. So now it's confirmed. He knew where she was living. And from what I've researched on stalking, unfortunately, moving doesn't usually work, especially with how easy it is that we can now use websites to find basically anyone's address. On another page in the notebook, there were paragraphs in Slovak with the headings, the meaning of life, ghosts, and prophets. Since Jorg was Polish, he could not really translate for police. Michael had copied down poetry and even written his own poems. And one said, quote, from our love, all that is left is a dried up spring. Yet all we had to do was push away the stone that was blocking it. I have as many memories of you as there are in a forest of trees. You're my only love, so ring me, please, end quote. Interesting. And Sutton was now realizing how obsessed Michael really was. I mean, if everything he knew was true, and Michael only went on three outings with Claire, this was overboard. It wasn't love. It wasn't anything normal or close to love. If he loved her, why would he take her life? Instead, it seemed like Michael seemed to be living in a fantasy world where Claire was his one and only true love and that they had shared much more than what they truly had. If Claire didn't want him back, that gave him a motive. Did Michael find out maybe that she had a new boyfriend? Well, Claire and Michael's autopsies were being conducted and they were overseen by an officer, Mark Leach. And originally, Claire and Michael were lying on two tables in the same room. And this made Officer Leach feel sick to his stomach. He felt like it was unethical that Claire was still in this man's vicinity, and I agree. And if you ever wonder why I don't put killer's faces in my thumbnails next to their victims, that is why I don't even want to look at their faces. I don't even want to have to name the killers. But of course, I have to tell you what happened, but I just don't want them to be remembered. I wish I didn't even have to use their names. Dr. Vesna Dejorovic conducted Claire's autopsy and discovered that she had been shot four times. The bullet to the back of her head would have ended her life immediately. 
Once on the tile floor, Claire endured three bullets directly to her face, which is of course overkill, and it is so clear that Michael wanted to take away her beauty. She had been struck below her eye, one on her left cheek, and once right near her chin. Michael's goal was to destroy Claire's face. He wanted to take away everything that made Claire, Claire, especially her beauty and her love for makeup. The shots were so precise that the doctor determined Michael had to have been trained in how to shoot a gun. And this made sense because we know he has a background in the military. As far as what Michael's autopsy showed, he had an entrance wound to the right temple. His pathology results revealed a cocaine blood level of 0.25 milligrams per liter, which is a pretty high dose of cocaine, especially for someone who doesn't take it regularly. Now, I don't know if this was a regular thing for Michael, if he was in fact an addict, or if he knew he was gonna do this that night and needed some cocaine courage, but it's one of those drugs that I've come to despise. I mean, no drugs are good, especially with the rise in coke being laced with fentanyl. It's destroyed so many lives. But cocaine is a drug with varying levels of toxicity, and the lowest dose associated with fatalities is 0.1 milligrams per liter. So the cocaine in Michael's system was probably not enough to kill him, but it accentuates the feelings of aggression. So it could have done that to Michael. So detectives wondered, did he take it to follow through? Or did he take the drugs and then decide to hurt Claire? After a few days, Sutton talked to Claire's mom to get her version of the story. And Trisha said, after three weeks of dating, Michael became possessive. He didn't want Claire going out anymore or even being around her roommates. And he would even get upset if Claire was around her mother. He especially didn't like her talking to Natalia because somehow he had gotten it in his mind that Natalia and Claire were just too close. He thought Natalia was actually a lesbian trying to get in between him and Claire, which wasn't the case at all. Michael wanted to spend every waking hour with Claire. He told her he loved her and asked, do you love me back? He was trying to bait her to say yes. And this made Claire very uncomfortable. She was like, mom, what am I supposed to say to that? Claire was still trying not to hurt Michael's feelings, but it was all too much. He even talked about his future plans for them together, and Claire didn't realize the extent of how toxic this man was being, but she knew she felt uncomfortable committing to a long-term relationship. When they'd only been on three dates, she finally told her mom that she planned to distance herself from Michael. In February, he had actually pre-planned a trip back to his home in Slovakia to where his mom and his ex-wife, Michaela, lived. It was a three-week vacation, and Claire was actually glad for the breather. When he was leaving, he asked Claire to come with him to the Stansted Airport to see him off and say goodbye, which she did. To Michael, this must have seemed like everything was going great in their relationship because Claire sent him a note for Valentine's Day as well, just thanking him for a nice month, and she said she was thinking about him and she missed him, which was true at the time. But that was also who she was. She was just a kind and thoughtful person, but she was on the fence about whether to pursue their connection in a more serious way. And then, Michael's texts and calls to Claire when he was on this trip were so persistent. And this actually turned her off. The night before he left to Slovakia, he called to remind her to come pick him up when his flight arrived three weeks after this, and it was supposed to be at five o'clock in the morning. Well, considering they weren't officially a couple, Claire called her mom and she complained about Michael's demand. It wasn't like she was just picking up, she was going out of her way. That's over an hour ride just to meet him and come get him. So Trisha reminded Claire, you don't have to do this. But Claire wasn't sure how Michael would react if she didn't meet up with him. And that's tough. Clearly Claire was torn, but it was still kind of the beginning of their relationship. But soon Claire would start to see Michael for who he really was. She did go to the airport to pick him up, and she didn't call her mom for the rest of the day, so Trisha became worried. And the next day, Claire called her and said she had finally broken it off with Michael and that she was actually scared of him. She said at the airport, Michael just figured that she was gonna carry all of his extremely heavy luggage, just burdening her with all of his things, and asked to go back to her flat because he was tired. 
and he didn't want to lug all of his luggage across London. Well, that's kind of rude. Plus, that didn't make any sense. Michael's shared flat was closer to the airport than where Claire lived. Plus, Michael wasn't welcome there, remember? Natalia had explained to detectives that she and Susan didn't want him there. He had already acted strange, so they told him he wasn't welcome. But Claire didn't want to cause issues with her friends, but when Michael said he would just be there for a little while, she agreed. But once they arrived at her place, Michael stayed there the entire day and all night. He would not leave. So Claire woke up the next morning and she had barely slept. She was just tossing and turning and socially drained and quite fed up. Claire told Trisha she actually had to go with Michael to the train station, hoping that he would get the message. She didn't want to flat out just kick him out the door, but he seemed to think he was still welcome to stay at Claire's anytime he wanted because he even refused to take his suitcase to the station with him. And when the train came, he wouldn't get on it. It was February and it was freezing outside and Claire did not want to be there. This was such a hassle. And when the second train came and Michael still did not get on, Claire decided to end things with him. Remember how the coworker Milan had said that Michael ended things? Well, this changed the story. Detective Sutton wasn't sure who had broken it off, but it definitely happened during this fight when Michael was supposed to go home and he wouldn't. This is when Claire told Michael he could do what he pleased and pick up a suitcase from her place another time, but he wasn't welcome to come and hang out. And at this point, she was done. She stood firm. She begged him to get out of her sight and she walked home alone. When she got back home, she put his suitcase out on the front and locked the door behind her. Minutes later, Michael shows up outside again. He's just sitting on this wall waiting outside and both of Claire's roommates told him to leave. That's when he got aggressive. He was yelling at them and saying that all he wanted to do was apologize to Claire. And Susan and Natalia were getting in the way of their relationship. He was there for two hours before he finally left. And Claire told Trisha she did not like him at all anymore. Who would? He's acting crazy and he's a grown man. And I kind of wondered if he felt like he didn't have as much as Claire did. Like he didn't have a nice place to live and he was searching for a woman that he could maybe take advantage of. And when Claire wasn't having it, he couldn't handle that. He couldn't handle not getting his way. But either way, the next day, they had to actually work together. And that must have sucked, having to face him and not be able to escape because Claire loved her job. And that day, not only did Claire see Michael, he came and he stood in line for the La Prairie counter among all the paying customers. And once he got up to the counter, he apologized to Claire for lashing out at her and her friends. He blamed all of his behavior on issues he had when he went back home to Slovakia. He said that it brought up a lot of feelings of anger and resentment, but Claire didn't care. She decided to just ignore him and go about her day working. She was tired of interacting with this guy and she knew if she did, it would only send mixed signals. But that's when Michael roped their coworkers into all this and this further embarrassed Claire and made her feel like she was in the wrong for setting boundaries and distancing herself. There were coworkers that came up to Claire all day saying, Michael just wanted to apologize. He just wants to be friends. And that is so manipulative. Those other coworkers had no idea what this man had been doing. And he was making it seem like he was the victim and Claire was being mean to him. She felt obligated to smooth things over. So she agreed, we can be friends, but nothing more. But this only made things worse. After the shift, he followed her home with a big bouquet of flowers. And you see, flowers are usually something that us women like to get. We're happy to get some beautiful flowers from a guy, but the underlying intentions, the reasons Michael is doing this are toxic. So that made them unwanted. Claire told him, I don't want your flowers. And she asked him to leave her alone but he insisted she's got to take them. So just to prove a point, she took the flowers, she left them outside on her doorstep, and that's where they stayed outside, wilting away for a week. Claire was again hoping that he would get the message, that she wasn't interested in the love bombing, and she certainly wasn't interested in him. 
And at work, Claire kept what was going on between her and Michael and all of his stalking a secret. She loved her job, and she was afraid she was going to lose it. She was also kind of in denial. She wasn't sure if Michael's behavior was bad or if she was just being an ungrateful person for rejecting his advances. So she confided once again in her mother. And Trisha did not know what to do either. Remember I told you at the beginning of this video, this case will leave you questioning what you would have done. And it may even be easy for you to believe that you would know what to do, but just keep watching. Michael's obsession was alarming. He followed Claire on the train back to her house every day. And he'd wait for her on the London Underground and he would sit across from her. He texted and called her up to 40 to 50 times per day. But still, Claire left him unread. Still, he would not take no or her silence for an answer. Even at work, she couldn't catch a break. Instead of manning the front doors, Michael would leave his post and he would stand right next to her beauty counter and he would plead for her to please take him back. She felt like she was always being watched. She couldn't sleep, she wasn't eating right, and her health was taking a hit. She even began getting all kinds of ailments, like eye infections, repeatedly. There were times where she would even catch a glimpse of Michael watching her in the mirrors in the perfume section, and that is terrifying. The whole month of March, Claire never felt like she was alone. It was exhausting and horrifying to her. And on March 26, Claire took the tube home and Michael was sitting right across from her the entire ride as she just sat there and ignored him. He asked Claire to talk to him before he did something stupid, but Claire remained silent. When they got to London Bridge, she got out and asked him to please leave her alone, but he wouldn't let up. So she turned and she ran away from him, hoping that she would lose him. But before she got to the next carriage, Michael ran after her. He came up behind her, and that is when he pushed her really hard. She was able to board the next carriage, and again, he caught up to her, and he sat right across from her. And at this point, Claire began to break down and cry. She couldn't take it anymore. And through tears, she asked him to please, please leave her alone. And if he didn't, she was going to call the police. And that's when he got right up in her face. And he said, if you dare report me, I'm going to kill you. Remember that. Wow. So now this has escalated to him threatening to become violent and even take her life. Claire did not know what to do. So she told him, if you leave me alone, I won't report you. For a second, it's like something switched in him. Like he went from angry to gentle all of a sudden. And he slowly reached out his hand and he touched her face, and then he tried to kiss her. And of course, Claire pushed away. Michael apologized, and at that point, he actually did leave. But he stood right outside the window, tapping on the glass, waving, and just publicly embarrassing her. And I can't even begin to imagine what it feels like to be trapped in public. It's like you're not caged in, but you are with this person's actions. Claire had a panic attack right then and there, and she called Natalia and then her mom, and she told them she wanted Michael gone from her life, and she didn't know what to do. She wasn't sure if Michael would follow through with his threat to harm her. And when Trisha was being interviewed after Claire's murder, she told Sutton that she was scared for her daughter's life. She knew that Michael was ex-military. They figured if Claire reported him to the police, and they interviewed him, and they decided to let him go, he might find her and kill her. And she couldn't risk telling Claire to go to the police when Claire's life was on the line. And so many women feel this same way. When people go tell them, oh, you need to get a restraining order. Well, that puts your stalker on notice. And many times it even agitates them more, more than it does preventing them from actually getting close to you. But Claire couldn't keep living like this. She was having nightmares and insomnia, her eye infections were persistent, and the lack of sleep was causing her work performance to plummet. And she was starting to get in trouble at work for making a bunch of mistakes. And you might think, maybe just blocking Michael's number or if they were on social media, you could block him on there as well. But she did block his number, and that didn't help. He always found another way to call her. 
That's another thing. We can block someone's number from showing up, but they can still text and they can still call. And then you'll have no record of what they were saying. You can't record any of it. You have no idea where their mindset is. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. Claire even changed her phone number and somehow Michael was always able to find the new one. But when the threat on her life started coming up in his text messages, she made the leap and she reached out to Brian, the Harvey Nichols lead security officer. He convinced her to call the police. And that's when Claire was interviewed by a woman named B.B. Shaw in the Southwark Hate Crime Unit. And this is where police records filled in more of the story. Sutton was granted access to read through Claire's interviews that she gave with Shaw. And I'm going to read you some of Claire's statements in her own words. And it makes me sad to know the pain that she was going through and how trapped she felt. Claire explained, quote, pretty soon into the relationship, I realized Michael seemed to be quite possessive. And because of that, and the fact that I didn't feel like we were going anywhere, I ended our time together on 28th of February, 2005. On that day, Michael became upset that our relationship had ended. I told him to get the train as all this occurred at the station. He didn't get on the train and instead followed me to my home address and sat outside the address for a period of roughly two hours. During this time, he kept calling me. I received roughly 20 missed calls and he came to the door and spoke to one of my flatmates and was being very rude and shouting at her and kept saying he wanted to talk to me. She said that I didn't want to talk to him, end quote. Remember this, for two hours he wouldn't give up. This is not normal. It doesn't show love, it shows disrespect of a woman's wishes. All too often men will say, well, she was just playing hard to get. Or a woman may think that a man being persistent means that he's just really into them. But this is not healthy. The very next day was a time that Michael followed her home with a giant bouquet of flowers again, one of those gestures getting flowers that most of us women would find charming, endearing, and romantic, but not after you've made it clear that you're not interested. And in another statement, Claire wrote this, quote, i become increasingly worried and frightened by Michael's behavior towards me, both at work and outside work. At work, Michael has constantly approached my counter while both on duty and pestered me to rekindle the relationship. I've often seen him nearby just staring at me. And on some occasions, I feel like he's using nearby mirrors to observe me, end quote. What do you do when someone is doing this and can't be reasoned with? Claire also said, quote, Another time after the 28th of February, I was leaving work when Michael approached me in full security uniform and stopped me by placing his hands on my shoulders from behind. He said, I love you, and I know you love me too. I said, no, I don't. And he said, yes, you do, you stupid little girl, shouting it in the street. And this all caused me to be distracted at work. This affected my sleeping pattern and that I haven't slept because I think he's waiting outside. I also had to change my phone number due to the amount of calls and texts he had sent, end quote. After reading these statements, they confirmed everything Trisha said and what Sutton had found out about Michael. Claire was terrified about him stalking her. He wasn't in love with her. He was getting off on any interaction they had, even the ones where he was rejected. In order to have a control over her life, he kept going. Shaw was trained in domestic violence cases, but this was stalking, which is completely different. It relies more on emotional abuse. At this point in time, Michael had never injured Claire, so Shaw classified Claire's case as low risk. But she did take Claire's accusations pretty seriously. She worked closely with Harvey Nichols and brought Michael in for a three-hour interview. And it's no surprise this manipulative man told a very different story than Claire. Michael said he had ended the relationship by making her feel like it was over, whatever that means. He said he felt responsible for sabotaging a good thing that they had. And this makes me think Claire actually broke up with him and he's trying to compensate for his insecurities by saying he broke up with her, even if it was nonverbal. Or perhaps in the moment of frustration, he just said, you know what, I'm through with you trying to see if this would change Claire's mind. But when it didn't work, he regretted it. In Michael's version, he said Claire told him that she had very strong feelings for him and that she was confused because she'd fallen in love with him so quickly. What? We know this isn't true because she would have told her mom 
and her roommates. Michael said that's when he realized he made a big mistake and he tried to get her back. But now she didn't want to be with him anymore, and that confused him. So he apologized over and over again. He said it wasn't stalking. However, he admitted to stalking behaviors, but he didn't classify it as actual stalking. He said he was sorry she was upset and he never meant to hurt her. This was all just a huge misunderstanding because of their language barrier. But here's the thing, that is total BS. He spoke English just fine. Michael was evaluated by a doctor who told Shaw that Michael had no psychiatric problems. He thought he was in love. He thought this behavior was normal. And I have to think that he might have been trying to control the narrative with the police and with the doctor the same way he tried to control Claire. Apparently, the authorities thought they didn't have enough evidence against him. So in early April, Michael was released on bail with no charges and just given a warning that he would be arrested if he visited Claire or Harvey Nichols again. This is kind of like a verbal restraining order. We know how well the written ones work. But Claire took his release as a sign she needed to move and fast. That's when she and her roommates signed a new lease for a new flat. Literally the next day, and I'm not even exaggerating, he showed up at Claire's old flat while she and her roommates were packing up their things. And he was standing outside waving and smiling from the street as if nothing had happened. Claire called the police. She was angry and she was overwhelmed. She had gone through all this trouble of moving and he's standing outside watching them. But when officers showed up, he was already gone. There was nothing they could do. On April 10th, Claire was all moved into her new flat and Michael showed up again. She didn't understand how he got this new address, but she figured he most likely just waited outside of her old flat and followed her or her roommates. And I mean, if this man is willing to stand outside of her house for two hours, then he's probably willing to spend even more time just watching the girls to find out where they were moving. But this was proof. Michael didn't take the law seriously, so Claire dialed 999, and this time, he was around when the police came. Michael smiled at Claire, and he was even holding up his handcuffed wrists together in the air for her to see as they were leading him away to a high-security prison. He saw this as fun. He wasn't phased by it. Michael was charged with harassment and threatening to kill Claire. Eight days later, he got bail again. His hearing was finally scheduled for late August, and Michael planned to plead not guilty because, again, he didn't see anything wrong with what he was doing. Shaw had no idea that Michael had been released, and neither did Claire. Claire was scared to face him in court, and she told her mom that she was not looking forward to the hearing. But in the months between Michael's release and his trial, Claire never saw him, so she actually thought this nightmare was over, and I wish it was. Shaw explained to Sutton that in August, she had no idea what Michael had been up to since April. Less than a month before Claire's murder, he stood trial at Tower Bridge Magistrates Court on August 31st of 2005, and his lawyer, Stephen Fiddler, convinced him at the last minute to plead guilty to the harassment charge. This would give the appearance that Michael acknowledged his mistake and he would get a plea deal. And there was another purpose to this. You know, the threatening to kill charge? Well, that would be dropped and Michael would only face a six-month sentence with a higher probability of getting probation and community service. Claire was actually pretty elated that she wouldn't have to face him in court. He just had to reappear on the 21st of September for his sentencing, and she wouldn't be responsible for putting him in jail for years, just a few months, to show him his actions are wrong. And he needed to get the picture, and he surely would at this point, right? So Claire truly didn't want to hurt Michael. She didn't want him to be angry about what she was doing, She just wanted her fears to be validated. She told her cousin Kristen, thank God it's all over. And she said to her mom, now finally people will believe me. And that's sad. I know so many women who have felt like this, like they're not heard, that they don't matter, or that they're even lying about what a stalker is doing to them. Michael was given bail again during his sentencing. The court never expected him to violate his bail terms, and neither did Shaw. She was swamped at the time. She was working on over 25 domestic-related cases that year, and in comparison to Michael's cases, his didn't seem as violent. He had no previous convictions. He'd stayed away from Claire for four months. 
Claire herself did not consider Michael to be capable of murder. Stalking wasn't even considered a serious crime in London in 2005. With all that being said, Shaw and Claire thought Michael was low risk. He had done everything he could to gaslight Claire, to the point where Claire, Shaw, Trisha, and everyone else underestimated how capable he was of evil, clearly. And that is what is so scary about this situation and others like it. Sutton still did not know how Michael had come in possession of a gun while he was on bail. It shouldn't have been possible. So he started to dig into Michael's backstory. Michael Pesh was born on July 12, 1975 in Czechoslovakia, which ended up splitting into two countries in 1992, the Czech Republic, which is now Czechia, and Slovakia, where he lived. These are beautiful countries, but they're severely affected by the Cold War. Michael ended up going to military school and he served in the army for six years. And when he left, he got a job working for the American embassy in Slovakia and got married. He and Michaela ended up getting divorced and then he moved to London on a student visa in 2003. The thing is, in 2004, Slovakia was incorporated into the European Union. And this meant Michael was given the opportunity to stay in London for as long as he wanted. And you know the rest. But after Michael was let go from Harvey Nichols and arrested twice, the police kind of lost track of him. However, Sutton was able to find out from Michael's passport that he actually left the country for Slovakia in April of 2005, even though he was on bail. How did Michael's passport make its way back to him? Investigators started to go down a rabbit hole to find out. In early May, Michael enrolled in a month-long target practice class back in his home country. And on June 8th, he applied for a firearm permit with the Slovakian police. This did include a background check and a letter from Michael's general practitioner. His doctor said he was of sound mind and his background check didn't come up with any criminal convictions. But remember, he was only charged with harassment and threatening to kill. He wasn't convicted yet, so there was no formal record. So he slipped through the cracks. After his firearm exam on June 14th, Michael waited to get his gun license in the mail. He legally bought a firearm in July. It was a Sassat 75 semi-automatic, which is a popular gun made in Czechia. And that was compact and really easy to conceal. This gun shot nine millimeter Luger bullets, which are the ones found at the crime scene. Even though Michael owned the gun legally in Slovakia, he wasn't allowed to have it in the UK. But Michael took a coach bus back to London on August 11th and he hid the pistol in his bag. The customs were supposed to check everyone coming through, especially if they were on bail. But somehow, he was never searched. Once more, this man slipped through the system's cracks. Michael knew to lay low until his hearing on August 31st. In the meantime, he planned out Claire's murder, knowing he was banned from Harvey Nichols, but also knowing Claire's schedule and which side doors were unguarded in the daytime from his own experience as a security guard there. It was too easy. But I have to wonder why he waited until September 13th to commit the crime. Did he make up his mind to do it and then follow through under the influence of cocaine? Did he find out that Claire was dating someone else? Maybe it was both. But clearly, he had practiced and purchased this gun to kill Claire. So her murder was premeditated, there's no doubt about that. Sutton was realizing that the system failed Claire, and Trisha knew it too. She demanded a trial into Claire's murder to see who had failed her and why. How broken was the law that her daughter was dead after reporting her killer to the police. Claire's funeral was held on Monday, September 26 of 2005, and hundreds of people showed up at St. Augustine's Church for the service. Claire's name was spelled out in pink and white flowers, and Trisha made her first statement to the public. She talked about Claire's last smile to Victoria and her passion for makeup. Claire loved her job at Harvey Nichols, but recently she decided it was time for her to move on, and she actually had a job interview lined up for Friday, September 16th to be a receptionist at a PR company. And that makes me so sad to know that she was doing everything she could to live, yet her life was cut short. Claire even started to move her things into her father's house where she thought she would feel safer and closer to her new boyfriend, who she was very much in love with and truly did plan to marry. Her murder devastated so many friends and family, not just because Claire was gone, but because no one saw it coming. And that's because there weren't many people 
that Clara confided in about what she was going through. Even her best friend Adam didn't even know about Michael. Claire was embarrassed. She also didn't like burdening other people with negative things. Many people close to Claire felt Michael deserved a lot more punishment than just a quick death that he received by taking his own life. But come on, this man was clearly a coward. Others close to Claire just wanted to put this tragedy behind them and honor her life more than anything else. Now here's something I wanted to mention. It's about Claire's parents, Martin and Trisha. They had very polarizing reactions. Trisha felt like the police had failed her daughter. She called for an inquest to question the integrity of the Metropolitan Police, the Crown Prosecution Service, and the UK's Revenue and Customs Department. She thought Michael should have been charged with putting people in fear of violence instead of harassment, which would have given him a five-year sentence instead of six months. She argued Michael was never properly assessed for risk, and if he had been classified as high risk, Claire would still be alive today. However, Claire's father, Martin, he blamed his ex-wife, Trisha, for the negligence in Claire's case. He said that she never took Claire's original complaints about Michael seriously. Martin said, quote, the two things that could have saved Claire's life would have been for her to leave her job and leave her flat. Neither of these actions were even taken or suggested by her mother, end quote. He also didn't feel the need to have an inquest. He wanted to put Claire's high profile case to rest and allow her brothers James and Phil to properly grieve without dealing with the media. And I understand where he's coming from. I also understand his anger with Trisha, but Claire was an adult. She did go to her mother multiple times. Even the authorities couldn't stop Michael. So how would Trisha have been able to? But I do understand Martin feeling betrayed, that nobody came to him. Nobody told him that Claire was in danger, but Claire was fully responsible to tell her own father if she wanted to. She was very close with both her parents, but they had different relationships with her. And Claire was afraid she wouldn't have been believed. And she trusted the police. She trusted they would take care of it. And Trisha trusted they would too. She is not to blame for her daughter's death. The only person responsible is Michael, and he's the monster. An inquest was done. It began in November of 2005 in Westminster's coroner's court. Trisha and Martin got in a fight in the witness box over whether the inquiry needed to even happen. Martin was stressing again that the toll this case was taking on his sons, what they would have to be put through, and that it wasn't the police's fault that Michael was bailed. But Trisha wanted something good to come out of this case. She wanted to be her daughter's voice. She needed to know what had gone wrong so other women who were stalked could stay safe from their perpetrators. B.B. Shaw testified that she had a high workload when she took on Claire's case, and only one day of domestic incident training without any training in stalking at all. She also testified she accidentally made a mistake. She never filled out a form called 124D. This form is always supposed to be filled out at the start of an investigation because it helps in deeming a person's risk as high or low. Michael was automatically classified as low because this form wasn't completed. So how is this not the police's fault? But Shaw admitted that she deemed him low risk anyway because of his lack of convictions. So filling out that form wouldn't have changed anything. Shaw was inexperienced, but did believe Claire was scared. When she heard about the Harvey Nichols shooting, she called Claire. And when Claire didn't pick up, Shaw knew that Claire had been killed. And she did feel responsible. She even broke down in tears halfway through her testimony. She had to take a break to collect herself. And it makes me sad that she wasn't given enough resources that she needed to make an informed choice. You can only work with what you are given. And stalking wasn't even taken seriously, and it still isn't here in the U.S. Natalia gave her opinion of what happened on March 26th when Michael had threatened to kill Claire on the tube. Natalia was drinking at a pub, and Claire actually called her. Claire said Michael had gotten on the tube with her after following her from work, and she told him to leave. Michael said, if you dare report me, I will kill you. So Natalia and her friend actually met up with Claire at the station. Claire told Natalia that Michael had just pushed her. So not only was Trisha's story about Michael pushing Claire true, Michael pushed her right at the edge between the tunnel and the platform. Natalia said, quote, I don't think she realized the seriousness of the situation. 
Clara was a lovely girl, but she was extremely naive, end quote. So basically what they saw and thought was that he was trying to kill her in that moment. He was trying to push her to her death, essentially. And that Claire wasn't seeing how serious this was at the time. Natalia told Claire she had to report him, and if Claire didn't do it, Natalia would. Claire thought if Michael got in trouble, she would be blamed, and she didn't want to waste the police's time if it wasn't serious. Well, guess what? Natalia knew it was serious, and she personally went to the head of security, Brian Lenahan. Good for her. Everyone deserves friends that are willing to put themselves out there for you. Susan testified that Michael liked to hang out at her makeup counter as well, talking about the breakup with Claire and feeling sorry for himself. And at first, she didn't take him very seriously. She just thought, okay, he needs to get a grip. But over time, he started to intimidate her. And she felt like her life was in danger because she stood up to him and she felt Claire was even in more danger of harm. The head of security, Brian, that I told you about, he testified that when Natalia reported Claire stalking, he started to pay really close attention to the CCTV footage and he watched Claire for half a day. And at every turn, Michael was there. He watched Michael lurking around the perfume department, looking at Claire through the mirrors, and he watched Michael harass Claire at her counter. So Brian took action and moved Michael to an upper level, hoping that that would work. But Michael also had access to the CCTV footage, and Brian caught him going down to Claire's floor right when she came into work and started bothering her again. He was obsessed, and he was unstoppable. So they suspended him from work on April 4th, with the caveat that he could no longer enter the store or contact the staff during his suspension. At this point, Claire did not intend to even contact the police. But Michael wasn't gone, because on April 6th, he was standing outside of Harvey Nichols all day and waited for her to get off work. Brian knew then they had to call the police. He recommended Claire make the call from his office, and she finally agreed. Harvey Nichols' upper management called Michael inside for a disciplinary hearing where he was then fired. Then two officers arrested him in the store and escorted him out, and Claire cried. She told Brian and her mom that Michael's expression of rage scared her, and she felt guilty even though Michael got himself in the situation. It turned out that Brian began his own investigation of Michael. He interviewed all the employees on the ground floor, and Malin said that Michael was depressed about Claire rejecting him. A part-time employee who was also going to school to be a lawyer said, Michael asked them what the maximum sentence for murder was in the UK. So even in March, he was planning on taking Claire's life. Brian looked at all of the text messages from Claire's phone, and there were thousands. Earlier on, Michael asked her questions saying, why are you so cold to me? Is it because you're English? This proved that Claire really was trying to create distance between them. Michael asked Claire to forgive him and repeatedly profess his love. Easter was on March 27, 2005, and at that time, things escalated. Michael was acting like they were together, and he said, quote, hey, it's our anniversary tomorrow. How should we spend it? End quote. He threatened to take his own life if Claire didn't take him back, which is emotional manipulation 101. And days before Claire reported him to the police, he texted her with, quote, if I can't have you, nobody else will, end quote. Claire made up her mind. This was a threat in physical writing, and it proved that her fears were real. The police would have to believe her. Brian testified this file was offered to Sutton. Remember that? but they initially declined to look at it due to investigative procedures. Brian remembered feeling frustrated by this. Relying on Claire's testimony alone was not enough to reveal everything that had been going on. The fact that Michael asked around about the maximum sentence for a murderer proves that he was a huge danger to Claire and could have been stopped sooner. Claire's support from the Harvey Nichols staff proves how strong her case was, and the courts letting Michael off on bail was wrong. However, on Thursday, August 9th of 2006, it was ruled that Shaw and the courts were bogged down by too much paperwork and complex procedures, and that the justice system was not to blame for Claire's death. No one was to blame. As a matter of fact, the court said that Shaw should get an award for a thorough investigation, and Claire's death could not have been foreseen. Hmm, what do you think of that? Trisha definitely wasn't happy with the outcome. 
it was a failure of the justice system that he was released on bail so many times and allowed out of the country. The inquest didn't give her the justice that she deserved, but Trisha found that justice herself. She worked with two other moms of women who had been killed by their stalkers to create an organization called Protection Against Stalking and assist the National Stalking Helpline. She works for the AAFDA, which stands for Advocacy After Fatal Domestic Abuse, and the family justice system to train police officers on proper protocol for handling stalking cases and determining risk factors. She convinced the prime minister to label stalking an official criminal offense. Because of Trisha's advocacy work, if you live in the UK and are being stalked, providing proof of fear can lead to a maximum 10-year sentence. Trisha's actions to make the justice system more effective actually earned her a member of the British Empire Honor Award in 2021. It's just sad that women had to die to make this happen. None of this will bring Claire back, and there will always be a void in Trisha's life where Claire was. Her work ensures that other people in this world do not have to face the same fears and the same doubts that her daughter did. Her brothers, James and Phil, now have their own families, and Trisha and Martin are grandparents. Claire's case has also been featured dozens of times, and it's because of the importance of stalking awareness. Stalking can happen anywhere, even in a world-class department store right in the public's eye, and it's serious. It's more prone to happen now because we're spending so much time on the internet, so please be careful. I know you may be thinking what I thought throughout this case, what would I do if this was happening to me? And the scary thing is, we don't know someone until we do. So sometimes there is no way to tell that someone will end up becoming dangerous. I'd recommend at the bare minimum conducting a background check, even if someone seems nice. And never feel guilty for setting boundaries and standing up to people who make you feel scared or uncomfortable. Stalkers get satisfaction by having interactions with you. So do everything in your power to remove yourself from their reach, whether that means blocking all attempts that they make to contact you or getting a restraining order if you can. Do whatever you can. Claire's story is very scary and heartbreaking. She did everything right. She truly did. She even went so far as to get the authorities involved. She was still killed. But no matter how hard her killer tried to erase her memory, he will never succeed because she will live on with all of you. So please share her story. I am so glad that I could tell you about her today. Thank you all so much for watching and please stay safe. I will see you in my next video. Bye.